added on the International uh, Space Station. Uh, so they'll be talking to Chris Cassidy, K5, KF5DRA, and they'll be talking to um, the iEducates uh, Conference, Information and Technologies Branch, uh, Department of Education in, uh, quiz in uh, Queensland, Brisbane, Australia. So please stand by. Uh, we'll start the audio feed now. The catch rates, JQ. Hello, CQ. This is VK for Delta November in Bundaberg. Uh, listening for the ISS contact tonight. Uh, this is VK for Delta November. Listening in Bundaberg, Queensland. Back at all stations, please stand by. This is John VK3 HJQ. Yeah, thanks, Kira. Uh, Anthony, are you online with us now? Yes, it's Lee here. Over. Oh, okay, fine. Thanks, Lee. No problem. All right, Lee, I'm about to start the, uh, the official part of the, uh, the proceedings, so please stand by. Station, as it flies more than 400 kilometres above the Earth over the United States of America. This is all accomplished through ARIS, which is Amateur Radio on the International Space Station. The ISS is currently approaching the USA and travelling along at around 27,500 kilometres an hour. The contact for today will be performed using the ARIS Telebridge Network, which is a worldwide network of amateur radio ground stations that enable students to contact the ISS. ARIS is an international consortium of volunteers from several nations that assist to develop and operate the amateur radio equipment on board the International Space Station. Some of those agencies that support ARIS are the American Radio Relay League, the worldwide AMSAT, Amateur Radio Satellite Corporations, the Canadian Space Agency, the European Space Agency, the Japanese Space Agency, Roscosmos, the Russian Space Agency, and of course NASA. The amateur radio ground station that will establish radio contact with the ISS today is ARIS ground station AB10C, located in Hollis, New Hampshire, United States of America, and operated by Fred Kremera. Thanks for helping us out today, Fred. This contact will also be ready broadcast worldwide through the amateur radio echo link and IRLP distribution network courtesy of Bob Pittman. But we have about five minutes before contact time. Our ISS link up today will be with the student participants at the IEDK conference, Information and Technology Branch, Department of Education in Queensland, Australia. Now let's check in with students and we've asked the facilitator, Lee Williams, to please tell us about the group that the students will be taking part today. Over to you, Lee. Thanks, Shane. With me this evening, I have six students from Mount Colson State School, Runcorn Heights State School, and Victoria Point State High School to ask committed capacity some questions, some of which are on behalf of students from around Queensland. And trust me, it was very difficult picking through just a few questions of those to ask. Over. Uh, about three minutes. Oh, sorry. Apologies for that. Uh, Fred, we've got about three minutes um, before contact time. Can you please tell us a little bit about your Aris ground station, where you are, and how you'd like to handle the contact? Over to you. Sure, great. Thank you. And welcome, everybody, uh, this evening uh, to uh, what hopefully will be uh, an exciting contact for you all. My name is Fred Kemmerer. My amateur radio call sign is AB10C Alpha Bravo 1 Oscar Charlie. I've been a licensed amateur radio operator here in the United States for about 10 years. I'm located in a small town in the state of New Hampshire, which is just north of Boston, in the northeastern part of the United States. The ground station here is fully computer controlled. We'll be using computer software to track the ISS as it comes up over the area here and uh, operate the radios and so on during your contact. Um, the antennas involved here are on about a 12 meter tower and uh, they will track the ISS through its entire pass. 
Um, you can learn more about the amateur radio station here at stationproject.blog. And I just uh, want to remind the students that uh, after you ask your question, um, please say over so I know to uh, key, uh, key the transmitter. All right, back uh, to you. We're about, uh, about a minute and a or two minutes from the contact. Go ahead. Excellent. Thanks, Ray. That's really good. And uh, certainly a pretty good idea of the systems with body um, ground stations or with this particular contact. Okay, well, we have uh, just a little over a minute before the space station comes over, AB 10 c out of the radio ground station. Remember, what we're doing on the ISS is an experiment, so we can never tell the results, positive or negative, until the experiment is over. And students, please don't forget to say the word over at the end of your question. As we said a little earlier, that's Fred's key to uh, switch between transmit and receive with the radio transmitter. In a short time, the station will be coming over to you, Hampshire, so it's all yours, Fred. Uh, good luck and uh, best wishes. Alpha 1 Sierra Sierra, November Alpha 1 Sierra Sierra. Any copy on Alpha Bravo 1 Oscar Charlie? Charlie? November Alpha 1 Sierra Sierra, November Alpha 1 Sierra Sierra. Any copy on Alpha Bravo 1 Oscar Charlie? Alpha Bravo 1, Oscar Charlie, this is uh, NA1 FN, fly clear, over. Hey, hello, Chris. Uh, wonderful to hear you. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, help us with our contact today. Are you ready for the students' questions? Over. I'm ready for the students' questions in Australia, and hello to the answer. Great to talk to you. Go ahead, over. All right, students. Good luck. Ask away. Thank <laughs> you. 
There's a very, very tiny air leak happening right now where I'm trying to close the two hatches and isolate and identify the location of leak. It's not, a, it's not an issue for us uh, personal safety-wise, but it's uh, a technical issue because over the course of the, of the next few years, it, it will use more oxygen than we had planned for. So it's not uh, just trying to identify that. But, but short of that, it, we've had a very successful uh, mission in terms of everything working as it should over. <laughs> Thank you. Now we have careful. Would you tell her dream being a pilot and this is the progression of it? Did you always dream of going to space ever? Actually, I, as a child, I never dreamed of going to space. I didn't really know that it was an option as a job to apply for. Uh, and, and I didn't realize this until I was much older. I was probably 25 or 26 years old when uh, it dawned on me that, that you can apply and you can just like any other job, and uh, uh, that's how I got into it. I, I, uh, many of my colleagues uh, dreamed of being astronauts as little boys and girls, but that was not the case for me over. What mindset do you need to have to be an astronaut? Over. Well, Lisa, I think it's a mindset that helps you with any job in life, but particularly for us, we, we like to say that uh, we, it's a fancy word called situational awareness, but it's more like just being aware of your surroundings, aware of others, aware of the spacecraft, and, uh, and understanding as things happen what's the most important uh, next job to accomplish, and that's being aware of your surroundings. Just like that can be helpful in school or at home, if, if you're aware of yourself, you're out, the other members of your family or your class and what people are doing, you can be a much more effective uh, family member and classmate. Over. Great. Now we have Ola again. How did you become the technical degree actor? It was when I met another ast uh, an astronaut uh, myself, and uh, in talking to him, uh, I realized that, uh, like I said a minute ago, it, it, it's an application anyone can apply, and, and uh, at that point in my life, I had qualifications that might be uh, attractive for NASA, and uh, so I decided to just try. It was um, it was through communicating with somebody else that got me interested over. Approximately, what year do you think space hotels will be physically possible to achieve? And do you think these space stations are the first steps towards developing space hotels ever? Well, I definitely think space stations are the first steps towards developing hotels. In fact, we have one module up here that is a test, temporary test module of, of an inflatable material, and uh, that's sort of a test that for future concepts of other uh, larger modules that might be uh, in, inflatable that could be hotels. I, I think in terms of what year, uh, it's difficult to say, but uh, it's technically possible or in, in the next uh, five years or so. I think in reality, it's probably more like 10 to 15 years uh, before uh, uh, tourists can come up here and, and really stay. Uh, but we'll see. I think I think it's only a matter of uh, the demand. If the demand is there and people are very interested, it can accelerate the process over. Right now we have Amelia. The new space you will see that is incredibly fast. Because of this, has your perception of time changed since being in space? So how oh, that's a great question, Amelia. Uh, we are going incredibly fast. We're going five miles every single second. And it takes us only 90 minutes to go completely around the world. But our perception of time really hasn't changed. We uh, we set Greenwich Mean Time, which is the time in London, England, on our watches, and that's what time we wake up at a normal 6:30 in the morning. We eat breakfast, we work at home, we have lunch, we uh, work some more, and we eat dinner, and all that is according to the, the time on our watches. And the speed that we're going around the world really doesn't impact that so much. Uh, I feel tired at the end of the day, and I'm ready to wake up in the morning to work. Thank you, Cecil.
hygiene of the standards. Example, how do you go for a shower, bath, toilet and shaving? Over. Well, that's a great question. If you don't keep on it, you can become a stinky person just like you can uh, on Earth. And uh, so we don't have a shower up here, but we we have baby wipes we can use for a quick clean. We can take a, a bag of water and squirt it on us and use uh, some soap or a moist towel and, uh, and, and rub all around and kind of get the oils and dry them off of our, off of us. There's not so much dirt like you would have if you were out playing in the, in the yard. Um, so it's really just our own audio oils that we have to get off. Going, uh, brushing our teeth and shaving is very normal, same way as, as on Earth here. My hair grows the same speed on uh, my face and on my head and my fingernails grow the same speed on my toes and fingers. Uh, and going to the toilet, the feeling of going is the same. Uh, we just have a different solid into. Over. All right, students, last question. Go ahead. Have you had a life-threatening experience on the space station? Over. Actually, one time it wasn't me. It was my my partner and friend on a spacewalk. Um, we were outside doing a, 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 a spacewalk that was supposed to be six hours, and one hour into it, my friend Luca had a problem where water was leaking into his helmet uh, and filling his helmet up with water. And uh, over the course of 45 minutes that it took us to get back inside, the water was uh, precariously close to his mouth and his nose and uh, threatened his ability to, to take the full breath. But we